culture, a time when, uh, when frankly, a lot of our culture actually thinks about religious things, which isn't necessarily always good. It's different being religious than being Christian. And, uh, but at least some people are oriented a little bit more toward things of the Spirit. We're going to kick off a, a new series today called Radical. And uh, let me describe to you a little bit of uh, what it's about. Kevin, if you can go to that repelling photo. Picture a, not Kevin, Jason, sorry. Uh, picture a, a mountain. Picture a mountain, and you're perched on, on top of that mountain. You're looking out over uh, the expanse of the, of the sky, and you're, you're attached to a rope, and, and, and that rope is woven through the harness that's uh, around your waist, and, and the instructor says, okay, turn around <laughs> and sit down in that seat and begin Repel down inside. What does that feel like? What does that first step feel like? What does that trust feel like? When you sit back and you say, okay, God, here I go. It's an experience of a lifetime in some ways. It's a thrill, it's a it's a wonder, but but how do you do that movement? <laughs> how do you how do you do the first step. That's the image I want you to have in your mind through this whole series. How much trust do I have in the Jesus who calls me to live a certain way? Not my way, but his way. How much trust do I have to sit back and trust my Savior? God, we ask you today to help us. Help us know you. Help us to hear you. Help us throughout this whole Lenten season to understand your call on our lives. God, to sit back to trust you. Faith. Help us You know, when two people get married, they enter marriage with, well, some ideas about what it's supposed to be like. Typically, most of them are not true or accurate. <laughs> In fact, the case could be made that every man thinks he's marrying someone who acts just a little bit like him, but really doesn't. And every woman thinks she's marrying someone who acts and thinks a little more like her, but he has no clue. And they have to learn how to speak a different language. To speak a, a language that will communicate to the other. And that's a lifetime, isn't it? I've been married for 26 years and it hasn't, the learning hasn't stopped yet. We hear love in a different language. And one of the great hurdles of marriage is learning to love so that your spouse can hear you. We tend to speak in our own language, which is totally natural, totally normal. But they need to hear us in their language. There's a, a great book called The Five Love Languages. How many of you have seen that or read that? Great book. If you haven't read it, uh, you, should, you should grab it. It helps you really learn a little bit from a different perspective on uh, what your love language is, what, what your best friends is, or your spouses, and, and learn to speak in that language. And it details the five most common ways that people hear love. And, and the five are uh, words of affirmation, quality time, receiving gifts, acts of service, and physical touch. Five most common <laughs> love languages. Each of these is a different way that God has wired us to hear the language of love. And everyone is looking 
for somebody to speak to them in the language they understand. It's the job of friends and spouses to learn to speak it. It started me thinking about the love language of Jesus. How does he speak to us? How do I need to hear him? It's not the way we're used to hearing a language of love. <clears throat> but it's the language we need to hear because it's his voice and it comes from his heart. This series called Radical because normal isn't working. We're going to look at some of the hard sayings of Jesus. Some of the call on our lives to live like him. And today it's about learning to love like him, but also learning to love him. My prayer is that we'll hear his language because it's the only one that gives us life. It's the only one that gives us breath. You know, much of what we have decided in the church, any church, or in Christianity in general, but much of what we've decided is Christian, I think is probably a little more personal preference than it is actually biblical. Actually what Jesus calls us to. How do we love Jesus the way that Jesus says we're loved? How does he call us to love others? Not according to what we think is best or we want, but what he says. How do we do that? If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke chapter 14. Here's this call of Jesus on our lives. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children... His brothers and sisters, yes, even his own wife, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him saying this fellow began to build but was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, that's a really important phrase we'll come back to in the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Now, I've often thought about doing a sermon series called Scissors. About the passages I'd like to cut out of Scripture. This is one of them. And Jesus is certainly not teaching a new commandment of, commandment of hating people. But these are pretty tough words. And this is how Jesus says we are to love him. This is his love language. He's teaching about the cost. Now, the clue to what is going on is in that phrase in verse 33. In the same way, it's about what we must be prepared to do to follow Jesus. Are you ready? Are you prepared? Have you counted the cost? It's about giving up everything, even our very lives for him. It doesn't say, by doing all of these things, you'll get into heaven. It's really not what Jesus is concerned about here. He's concerned about followers. Jesus clearly teaches that through faith in him, we have eternal life. That's, okay, great. You know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? <clears throat> That's the key to unlock the, the gates of heaven. Grace, his grace alone. 
What Jesus is now saying is, all right, until the day you walk through those gates, how are you going to live? How are you going to love me? How are you going to follow? What's your life going to look like? Are we willing to place him in first position? And place the most important people in our lives in second place. Let's paint the scene. <coughs> Large crowds are traveling with Jesus because they've seen him healing people, <coughs> feeding people, and teaching people at no cost. There's no offering basket that gets passed in the crowd with Jesus. Why not follow him? Sounds like a good deal. You can get something for nothing. I have no doubt some of the crowd were thinking that. However, now we see Jesus turn around and say something to them that every motivational speaker in the world would say, don't do. Don't say something hard. Keep the crowd moving with you. <laughs> Keep the people together. you got a great following. Don't blow it. Jesus turns around and says this. Jesus isn't focused on the crowd. He's focused on fully devoted followers. Have you counted the cost? Following him is not without cost. You have to place him before other important people in your lives. You have to place him even before yourself. Now, to get his point across, he uses some language that can be hard to understand. It might even be offensive. Did you know that when you have high demands, when you have high expectations, high commitment, that not everyone will want to go to that level? Some people will turn around. Stop that. Jesus says you must hate everyone else but him. So if your parents forbid you from following Jesus, you follow Jesus. In comparison to how you love me, Jesus says, it should look like you hate everyone else. In the stress of working and making ends meet, when we're tempted to cut out commitments to Jesus, commitments to fellowship and worship, commitments to reading the scripture and to prayer, to serving and to sharing our faith, what will we choose to do? This is the call of Jesus. In our culture, there's one thing above all others that draws us away from Jesus. In our culture today, sports. Now, I could be talking to the choir today, because if you're not here, <laughs> it could be. kids playing them and adults watching them, when, when, when we here are planning the church calendar, we deliberately avoid home Bengal football games for certain things. Because even if the game starts at 1 o'clock, somehow people can't come to worship at 9.15. It takes over. It completely takes over. We watch them at home. We go spend money on them. We let our kids play. <clears throat> I've watched families throw away their foundational commitment to Jesus by prioritizing sports for months at a time. And then coming back to church thinking they can just jump right back in to where they were and they left. And it never works. It didn't count the cost. It may be the chase for the almighty dollar, the, you know, when your kid's eight years old and playing soccer and they're fairly good and somebody comes up to you and says, they can get a college scholarship. If you'll only put them on this travel team, and they'll travel to three different states at eight years old. And dangling the dollar. 
The Rakers by no means do everything right in life. But I can say that putting Jesus first doesn't have to take you out of the excellence in sports. Many of you know my son John. He's a senior this year, swimmer. We've always made Jesus first. Which means when, when you're at a swim meet or you're approaching a swim meet that goes on Friday night, most of the day Saturday, and most of the day on Sunday, we didn't always swim on Sunday. Nope, we're swimming Friday and Saturday. That's it, because Jesus is first. My kids would get out of practice early on Wednesday nights to come to crash groups, to small groups, student ministry. Totally supportive. Why? Because Jesus comes first. And now, as a senior, my son's trying to figure out what to do, and he's got multiple scholarship offers sitting on the table. And he may or may not choose them. But it's just evidence to me that you don't have to give up excellence in sports to put Jesus on the back of it. Honor Jesus first. And what you need Come. That's what he's saying in Luke 14. Count the cost. Count the cost of what it means to put him first. Follow him. Jesus says that even if the things you are busy doing are about good things, helping your family, putting your kids through college, you know, good things. He says, don't pursue them at his expense. Nothing, not even your wife nor your kids, is more important than following me and obeying my commands. That's what Jesus is saying. Following Christ means that because he is our Lord, we will follow him and do whatever he shows us. I've learned that I must be constantly looking at him if I'm going to follow him. I've got to keep my eyes focused on it. I've got to keep my heart pointed toward it. So I wonder what you're thinking at this point. Oh my word. What does it mean for me to follow Jesus? What does it mean in your life? This is one of these messages where I have to be really careful because I'm, I'm not a... I'm not a person that motivates my guilt. That's not what I'm trying to throw at you today. I'm trying to throw at you the words of Jesus that are hard for us to swallow. But if we don't swallow them, if we don't take them in, <coughs> we will miss the life he offers. You've got some notes in your bulletin. Let me uh, lead us through a little bit of what does it mean to love Jesus in the language of Jesus? What does it mean to love Jesus in the language of Jesus? First of all, it's choosing who is first. It's choosing who is first. That's what we've been talking about. Who is first in your life? Who's number one? I have to confess that so often, so often when I'm challenged with these kinds of words of Jesus, I look at him and I say, okay, Lord, there's definitely these areas you are bringing to my heart and my spirit and around my heart and my But you're not number one. There's all, there seems to always be an error. <laughs> it, 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 you you kind of take care of one and, 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 then, and then he says, okay, now your heart's ready for the next one. He doesn't just throw it all at us at once. It's, it's, really, it's really good. Who's first? <clears throat> Speaking the love language of Jesus means putting Jesus first. What does that look like for you in your life? I just described a little bit of how we try to do it raising kids with a sports crazed culture. I want them to have all those opportunities, and yet, you've also got to make choices. What does it look like for you? Where do you need to shift someone? 
You know, the season of Lent is traditionally a time of introspection, a time of denial, a time of getting rid of something in our lives. And very often it becomes a selfish thing, a personal preference, like let's stay away from sweets and pop. And really, we want to stay away from sweets and pop because we feel like we want to lose weight. It has nothing to do with Jesus. So our spiritual commitment becomes self-centered. What do you need to pull back from? And I'll give you something. Here's the second thing that I think the love language of Jesus is toward him is choosing to be burdened. Choosing to be burdened. Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. The cross of Jesus was a choice that Jesus made for us. To give himself for us. It wasn't something that was thrust upon him. It wasn't something that was not a, a non-choice. He chose to sacrifice himself on our behalf. He picked up his cross and he calls us to do the same. The cross for us is not a just some difficulty in life, some handicap that we have. That's not a cross. I've heard it referred to many times. And the person you're married to sitting next to you is not a cross either. Just make sure of that. The cross of Jesus is a way to say, not my will, Father, but yours. The great devotional writer Oswald Chambers wrote this. The cross of discipleship is that I daily and hourly delight to tell my human nature that I am not my own. I no longer claim my right to my son. See, the dedicated self won't do. Dedicated to Jesus, that doesn't work. Only a self that is denied can be used by him. Taking up your cross means that you take up a redemptive ministry, as a matter of fact. Jesus redeemed us by his sacrifice on the cross. And when we take up our cross, we willingly give ourselves for the benefit of others, to redeem relationships. This is a daily ministry, rather than an off and on affair. Well, I'll be dedicated until such and such season starts. And I won't be as committed. Being a disciple is a full-time job regardless of our vocation in life. I was talking yesterday uh, with a, a new friend who lives in Texas. Uh, he's a former pastor now working as an executive coach and leadership trainer. And uh, and at the end of our conversation, we switched our topic from coaching to the God calling on our lives as pastors. And I asked him, I said, Tim, do you feel like you've left your call because you are no longer working full time at the church? And he I could barely get the question out. He said, absolutely not. In fact, I would say I do just as much for the kingdom now as I did as a pastor of the church. I do as much coaching slash counseling. And people know what his former profession was, so they'll come to him and they'll ask spiritual questions. And he said something that really, really struck me. He said, I go to work just as prayerful and committed to Jesus now as I did when I was heading toward a church. See, because for us pastors, 
We often just attach our calling to being in a local church. And sometimes when I encourage and challenge you to say you're a minister of the gospel wherever you work, it doesn't always translate because us pastors sometimes can't get past that idea that it's here even though we want to encourage our people that it's anywhere. See, it's the choice we make to put Jesus first no matter what we're doing. My, my friend, Tim, may be a coach and a trainer, but he is a Jesus follower first. Serving where he is and with what he does. This is a picture of what Jesus is talking about. Choosing to be burdened for others in his name, no matter where we are. Taking up your cross, choosing to serve the kingdom from the place He's put. It means I have to see everyone I work with, those I run into, and yes, even those who cut me off on the way to work, as in need of Jesus, as people in need of encouragement to follow. It's a choice that we make time and time again, and I would dare say every day every moment again until until the choice the Jesus choice becomes the only choice we have that's the goal that's how you know that Jesus is first now beyond being choosing to be burdened the third thing is the choice to die this is the love language of Jesus you see, Christianity isn't figuring out how to live. I think I'm figuring out that Christianity is about learning how to die so that I know how to live. Sometimes when I'm challenging a family to begin tithing, giving 10% financially to the mission of Jesus at Cornerstone, they will look at me and in some way, shape, or form say this phrase. But pastor, I have to live. And I say, actually, no. You have to die in order to know how to live. It's all throughout the scripture. You can't get away from it. Unless a grain of seed falls to the ground, Jesus says, and dies, you can't live. Unless you deny yourself, you'll, you can't live. Try to save yourself, and you'll perish. Lose your life for the sake of Jesus, and you'll find it. It's all throughout the Scripture. Dying is a fearful thing in this life. It's not a bad thing when you think about where you're going. But dying to myself here now. Longtime friend of mine refuses to become a Christ follower because he's fearful about what he might have to give up, what he might lose. Let me tell you one way that Cornerstone is going to be walking into this dying thing. I'm going to have them turn off this recording because it's uh, not something we, uh, at this point, want to publicly put out there. Um, 